Hello, everyone. How are you? I am so grateful to be here today with you all as we celebrate the continued um, artistic expressions um, presented through the new American Theater Fest um, put on by In the Margin. My name is Whitney Reed. I am the founder of The Urban Window. Uh, which is a marketing and communications firm working to elevate QT uh, representation within the theatrical field for um, me media and news coverage. Um, today, we're here to have a really enriching conversation. Um, the title of today's conversation is Power in Theater Coalition Building, and we have some incredible leaders uh, on this live today. I would love to introduce all of them um, and we will have that time. But first I would like to acknowledge uh, the land that we're on, um, thank, thanking um, the original caretakers of this land. I come to you from the uh, land of the Piscataue, also known now, now known as uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, I ask that as everyone introduces themselves, that they have the opportunity to also speak and acknowledge um, the land that they are on, as well as the descendants of those original caretakers of the land, um, because they are on this call today, because they are watching today. And we're so grateful um, for some of the forced sacrifice, but also figuring out better ways that we can be a part um, of a true authentic land back movement. So I am so happy again to be here and I would love each person as we're on this call uh, to talk a little bit about themselves and the organization that they're here representing. First off, I think it would be amazing to start with Leo Grierson of Juvenalia Collective. Thank you, Whitney. Hello, everyone. My name is Leo Grierson, uh, he, they. I currently reside on the lands of the Shasta and Tecalma people. Uh, thank you all so much, uh, living descendants of these people for taking care of this land. And I'm going to work tirelessly to make sure that we get it back into your hands. And um, I am the artistic director of the Juvenilia Collective, and we are a multimedia collective, uh, primarily focusing on theater and podcasts that uh, bring a, an adult uh, theater for with a youth tinted edge, or sometimes call ourselves a youth theater for adults. Um, we focus on uh, coming of age stories of underrepresented groups, uh, and we're very interested in exploring multimedia in that realm. And we are so happy to be a partnering company with In The Margin on the new American Theater Festival. Beautiful, thank you so much, Leo. Um, let's move on, on to uh, CJ Ochoco with Breaking the Wave Theater Company. Hello, Hafiday. My name is CJ Ochoco. Um, I go by she, her pronouns, uh, coming today from uh, the land of uh, Cherokee. I am part of Breaking Wave Theater Company. We are a uh, nonprofit theater company that's based out on Guam. Um, I'm not currently on Guam right now, um, but <laughs> uh, we do our work on Guam primarily, and we are a community-based organization that aims to use theater for personal and social change. And yeah, we're super excited to be here um, and yeah that's me amazing thank you so much cj uh let's go over to lindsay lindsay birch uh, with b street theater hi everyone really excited to be here thank you whitney uh, my name is lindsay uh, she her pronouns and residing on the land of the Miwok, Wali, and the Shannon peoples, colonially known as Sacramento, California, where uh, the Sophia home of the B Street Theater is located. 
We are one of the producing partners for the New American Theater Festival with In the Margin, who will be introduced shortly. And uh, we focus on new works and contemporary plays. And as, uh, you know, just being open, uh, the predominantly white institution here, we're both uh, in this panel, meaning uh, we're doing our work both internally and externally to uh, create partnerships and relationships that will help to uplift marginalized voices and tell those stories. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, let's move on to the one and only Jazz Hall uh, with uh, the Womb Collective. Thanks so much, Whitney. Um, hi, folks. My name is Jazz Hall. My pronouns are they, them. And I am the artistic director, curator, uh, producer of Womb, the creation space, which is a meant to be a safe space for queer independent BIPOC artists to come together to share support and create. Um, so I find myself in great company here with ITM and the Juvenilia Collective and CJ Ochoco with Breaking Wave. And I also have to just give a huge shout out to HowlRound for sponsoring our ASL interpretation by the Urban Jazz Dance Company and our wonderful Valerie and Benny who will be joining us tonight. Um, I, Honestly, I'm just so grateful to be here in space and uh, I'm also calling in from the lands of the Nokoch Tank and Piscataway peoples, uh, also known as Washington, DC. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, we have uh, Riel um, Alanis Vargas with In the Margin. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hendi Hiari Kwarishkani, Real Vargas Alanis, Anapueshkani, Yokut Territory. Hi, everyone. My name is Real Vargas Alanis, uh, Day Series. And I am calling in from, no, not, sorry, my series now. <laughs> um, <laughs> series, like, hey, what's up? Um, calling in from Yokut Territory. Uh, so in the margin, we are a service-minded community-oriented arts and advocacy company composed of multifaceted intersectional creative producers and community organizers. So ITM seeks to break patterns and cycles of harm individually, collectively, and globally to carve capacity for the ever-changing and ever-evolving forms of storytelling that inspire a radically inclusive, equitable, accessible, intersectional, and just future. Um, I'm the artistic director of In The Margin, and I am so excited to be here with everyone. Um, it's been quite, it's been a, a pleasure to work with each of these folks and each of their companies and collectives and organizations. Um, and I'm just excited to dive into further conversation. Um, yeah, I'll send it back to you, Whitney. Absolutely. I mean, we're going to keep it really easy, really, really breezy. And, you know, I like to say that we're all friends. We're all family here. I mean, as a member of ITM, a proud member of ITM, I really enjoy the work that you all do individually and through your company and some of you all in relation to ITM. My first question for anyone that wants to go first uh, is a question that I, I usually have when I'm talking about leadership. And my question is, when did you realize that you could not do it by yourself? Because as we talk about coalition building, um, we're really talking about reaching out to people that have skills and capabilities that you may not either have or you might not have the capacity to hold within your company. Um, so my question is, when did you realize that you could not do it by yourself? And I'll actually, let's start with, let's start with uh, In the Margin. I think because we're here uh, with uh, NATF, the New American Theater Festival, the, the, I guess you can't really say the first annual, but the first uh, New American Theater Festival, I'd love to talk with you about when do you realize you couldn't do it by yourself because uh, you connect with so many different companies. You connect with so many different artists, creatives, curators, um, not only giving them an opportunity to be seen, um, but also allowing your company to grow uh, into the magnitude of what it will be uh, for hopefully the next hundred years. So, uh, or until it's no longer needed. So yeah, let's talk about, let's talk about when do you realize you couldn't do it alone? Um, that's, 
it, it's not about when I realize that I can't do it alone. It's realizing that I don't want to do it alone. Mm. Um, and so for me, it's from the get go is um, resource sharing, not even resource sharing It's more of just collaborating. And so a lot of the folks that I work with are folks that I've followed for a long time, um, people that I have intersected with, people that I have worked with, uh, whether individually or um, through a project or via a different organization that we had the pleasure of intersecting with, um, where life just kind of found us in that same space or in that same place and wherever in the world we, we were in, right, at that moment. Um, and it's having crafting and, and having and developing those relationships and dynamics are very vital. And to me, it was more of, there is a movement that is happening. How do we contribute to this movement? Because ITM, I see more as a, a big form of advocacy. It's one of our biggest forms of um, community organizing. And so the way that I approach it is as a community organizer and activist. Um, and so it was about how do I bring in and who do I bring in to help us continue to craft this new American theater that we want to see and that we deserve to see? Um, and how do we uplift one another in order to achieve that? Because I intersect with so many beautiful, wonderful artists and worked with incredible uh, companies and so it's what can we, if what we can do individually is powerful, and if as individuals, we are strong leaders and very powerful entities, what are the possibilities when we come together to create something? And so NATF is one of the examples of what can happen when we all come together to create something. And the way I say it is, we sometimes get in, um, in theater, sometimes we get p uh, pitted against each other. And especially when it comes from marginalized folks, because there's such a scarcity mindset that we need to fight one another or be against one another to get like a little crumb um, or some sort of like small commission or this or that. But it's how do we work together to get a whole damn loaf of bread or an entire bakery? Um, so yeah, that, that's just a little bit about that. Um, and I'll send it over to whoever wants to expand on that or yeah. I'll go. Uh, yeah, I, I guess this is going to sound very cliche, especially coming from a youth oriented theater, but um, I would say I knew I couldn't do it alone when I was on the playground, uh, making stories with my friends and, and building narratives together that way, which of course we didn't know it at the time, but we called it playing. And I think playing is always more fun when you're doing it with friends. And I I kind of approach uh, collaboration the exact same way. I think it should always come from a place of joy and building narratively together. Um, and uh, this idea of, of sharing resources, like sharing snacks on the playground, like, oh, you give me a bit of your sandwich, I'll take some of your pudding. Um, and then we're all eating. And that's, that's the feast, that's the coming together, that's the play. And I think what has, propelled me forward in my leadership and in my collaboration with these wonderful folks here is that I love playing with them and that they always make the, the playing really, really fun and, and, and leading from a place of, of desire to experience joy together, which is really radical. Um, and that's, yeah, just taking it from a childlike perspective that way. When I was a, when I was a kid. Awesome. Pass it off to whoever's next. My internet's unstable, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you sound great to me so oh, I'm good. <laughs> I haven't experienced it yet hey CJ can you talk a little bit about um when you realized you couldn't do it alone or when you realized that you you had to incorporate other folks or why you wanted to incorporate other folks within within your company yeah, so I, I think we, I realized we couldn't do it alone from the very beginning, <laughs> from the get-go in 2018 when we were um, 
when me and my colleagues were coming up with this idea of like, hey, let, let's start a nonprofit theater company on Guam. Uh, there hadn't been one um, for about 10 to 15 years prior to us uh, jumping in. So uh, we were kind of, you know, out going out on a limb and just trying to figure it out. And uh, I think we knew from the get go that it was definitely going to be more than just like the five of us who had begun the company. Um, and it wasn't until um, January of 2020, when I had the opportunity to meet so many of the folks on this um, call right now um, through through my time at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, that that you know idea of building um, across the ocean, you know, because Guam is so far away. For those who don't know where Guam is, it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We are, um, you know, we're we're standing alone there and we're technically, you know, a US territory, but we're so far removed geographically that it is a little bit challenging to build these connections. And um, through my time there, and then of course, with the pandemic and the rise of the virtual space, it finally became a reality for us to connect with theaters and to really reach across, um, you know, the ocean really <laughs> and, and connect. So I'm definitely, you know, we always say there's not, good things about this pandemic, but we are grateful for um, this space that brought us a little bit closer to everyone else. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, CJ. Hey, Jess, can we talk a little bit about what it means to, to not do this alone? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's so interesting. I feel uh, as someone who like navigates the world, dealing with imposter syndrome and coming from like a survival-esque type upbringing, right? Like um, I learned very early on to be very independent and to try to solve everything on my own. And honestly, coming to this work and being in space with other like wonderful, beautiful collaborators from all different walks of life and backgrounds, like it really was not necessarily, um, well, let's be honest, I am not an editor. I spent the pandemic trying to teach myself to edit. I spent the pandemic trying to teach myself so many other new skills because I was trying to hold all of this by myself. And it's like, well, first off, there are other people who already have this skills where that's the thing that they love doing, the thing that brings them joy. And so like, why not offer up one, like save myself from that and offer up space for people to create inside of their medium. But also like I, as one individual in, with the intention of creating a truly collaborative space that can hold any and everyone from all walks of life. Like who am I to say that my one experience and my one vantage point on the world can truly encapsulate or include people from other experiences and walks of life. So like, honestly, it's, it was less of like a, a point in time of like when I felt I needed to expand and more so like, oh my gosh, what a disservice I'm doing to myself and to our community at large if I don't expand and allow just other people to come into this space and fill it up with themselves and their voice too. Um, we're all seeking community and to be included. And I think that that community needs to be as colorful and as diverse as it wants to be um, so that we can really capture the folks that uh, are in need of that space. And also too, I just wanna circle back to something that Real said that I think is just so poignant. Um, so like Real mentioned the scarcity mindset that like people have come from. And I also just wanna to name too that like, I don't know that the scarcity mindset is like a naturally occurring thing, um, but perhaps something that's been imposed on people by the systems at large. And so um, I think that this work, the more collaborative we allow ourselves to become and the more people that we bring into this to branch out um, is really just working to help undo that and like unweave that, I don't know, nasty web that we've all been caught up in. And um, I don't know, allow us to see like a new way of being as we move forward artistically and collaboratively. Absolutely. I love the concept of this not just being something that happens, um, but having some sort of context um, to, to give us understanding of how we can actually move forward so we can have some, some clear vision in our missions. Um, yeah, speaking of context, Lindsay, let's talk a little bit about when you realized as a white led organization that you could not do this alone, right? And, and not only that you could not do it alone or when you realized you couldn't do it alone, but what you might have to shift in your organization to actually be a safe space for QT BIPOC folks to work with you as you built this uh, coalition. 
Yeah. I, you know, I've been listening to everyone and so many relatable things with the scarcity mindset and, you know, theater, not really having this mentality that rising tide raises all ships. It's kind of like only one person can be on this ocean, which is um, so incorrect. And uh, obviously it's no secret that with the murder of George Floyd and the racial reckoning that was happening in America, that uh, reckoning was happening in a microcosm in the, in the theater community at large, uh, everything from Broadway to smaller groups and regional theaters were wrestling with this idea of what does it look like to be an anti-racist institution or a multicultural or inclusive organization and what, how far are we from that and what steps need to be taken to, to work towards that. It's not going to happen overnight, um, but changes can be made. And for me, the biggest shift um, it, that I think had to be made in, in my thinking and in the organization's thinking and um, continue to be worked on is this idea of a gatekeeper um, who is saying, yeah, we're going to do that play and these actors and that director and um, really just perpetuating their own networks uh, in a large sense, the folks that they have had connections with, which frankly at a predominantly white institution can be predominantly white artists um, and saying, what happens if you open that gate and you're not saying yes to this person's work and no to this person's work, but you're building a coalition in which everyone's work can thrive and be developed and supported in the way that that particular work needs to be. Um, and I think also it's, uh, the theater is a, obviously a very goal oriented art form, right? Uh, in a lot of ways, oh, we're working towards an opening or a press review or what have you. And, uh, and I think in a lot of ways that that is, it's a function of, of white supremacy in those systems uh, that have said like, um, you know, to, to rush some, you know, to work towards something so specific when what happens when we can all come together to develop work and support work without some specific expectation of where it has to be and where it has to go within a certain timeline. Um, so I think those are really two specific things that have come to light for me throughout this collaborative process. And uh, I think it's things that we have to continue to work on as an organization. And this is, it, it's also been amazing. I, in my theater career, I've heard like, oh, you know, our theater has a hit show and theirs doesn't or theirs does, so we don't. And like this idea that we can all come together and that everyone's um, work can be elevated in a, a helpful and supportive way is, is a shift in thinking that I think needs to happen across the industry. Absolutely. I have a question. I'm, I'm really interested in how you implement this want and this need on a daily basis, like within your company, within, you know, your colleague group. How do you, as someone who works at B Street, um, not just help to dismantle white supremacy, but how do you actually work to ensure that the coalition that you are building with other QT BIPOC organization, organizations is not um, ruined, right, by someone within your org um, who might have some work to do? I think that's a really great question. And I, that's something I struggle with, uh, of course, because uh, as we've come at this from our organizational standpoint with our staff uh, and our board of directors, it becomes pretty immediately clear um, that within a white-led institution, uh, everyone can be at different points of readiness to achieve, to, to begin the work, to continue the work, to, to wherever they're at in their process. Um, and there's, of course, the balance between um, pushing them to be there and then alienating them um, by, you know, putting them in a position where they're going to completely shut down uh, and not be ready or even willing to engage in those conversations. Um, and I think it is, it's a challenge because we, I don't, um, 
I don't know, I struggle with, uh, personally, we're just having a conversation, right? So I struggle personally with like, um, protecting the partners and the coalition, um, and then wondering how helpful that is for the rest of the staff, because I do know the places that some folks are in. And part of me says, I want to put these people in a bubble and like, kind of protect their interactions with that individual. But then what good does that ultimately do for everyone? Right? If this per this person is not going to learn anything or make any progress, if they are siloed and allowed to continue their way of thinking. Uh, so to me, it's it's about at least attempting and bringing people in at the beginning of the process and sort of so they understand the goals of what we're trying to do and that um, this is not, as long as I'm with this organization, at least, that's all I can speak for, this is not a one-off event. This is an ongoing relationship that is going to be cultivated. Um, there's going to be successes, there's going to be challenges, and we have to come together to continue it. Um, and, you know, I, that's, and then I think, you know, we've, I've had some, some wonderful conversations with these folks and I think transparency amongst this coalition is really important and just speaking up about things that might have caused harm uh, and then learning how to have those, that's part of my ongoing learning is how to have those conversations um, where the, with the folks who were harmed and then with the folks who caused that harm and how we can mend those, those bridges because it will happen, um, but the progress is in how we approach it and how we prevent it from ha continuing to happen and being perpetuated. Right, right. Thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate it. As you were talking, I was like, yes, it's real. We are on HowlRound. A real conversation <laughs> is happening. I am so grateful to, to just be here in this space where we can have some real conversations and really like break it down. Let's talk about, you know, the oper the operationalizing of coalition building. You know, I'm really, as you were talking, I was thinking about like, oh, wait, like there are rainbows and there are like red flags in every every opportunity to build, right? And so I kind of want to like, if anyone is really interested in like the rainbow, right? Like what do you see in a company or an organization that makes you, uh, that's magnetic, that makes you lean into wanting to build something with them? And then like, what is the red flag? Like, what is the thing that makes you say, like, absolutely not, I'm staying away. Like, I, would, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. So anyone that feels moved to speak, you're more than welcome. I think in regards to the rainbow, it's about who aligns with my organization's mission and vision, who is currently doing the work, quote unquote, who's doing the work, since that's always something that we hear. Um, it, it, for me, it's more of like, who's actually implementing things? Who's the one who is doing something that is not just lip service? Um, so can we, we Sorry to interrupt. Can in no, this moment, can we just decolonize doing the work by talking about in implementing? So go ahead, go do your thing. Uh, yeah. So um, I, in regards to, I'm sorry, I'm just over the term doing the work because um, it's very much like, oh, okay, you're doing the work to treat everyone fairly. Um, you you can that that doesn't come to you naturally, but apparently it doesn't. And so that's the thing that the rainbow to me is who is the one treating folks fairly and equally, who is um, who is also creating art and not just who is creating art that is also pushing the button in equity, who are the folks that are on the front line, um, who are the folks that also have um, a community centered uh, vision who has the the willingness to collaborate and have that open space um, who is welcoming and who are the folks that are kind of yes anders that they're like cool I love that let's let's figure it out um, and I think something that we as cutie BIPOC folks 
tend to not receive are opportunities and opportunities to fail. And I say fail because for me, failure is not doing it. Um, for me, if something does not go the way that you thought, it you still did it and you're not with a what if. And so one of the things that happens within PWIs is that we are not really allotted any opportunity to fail and we have to be, we have to be successful or else you close the door behind you through everyone who shares an identity that you do. Um, and you're expected to represent that identity. And so those are the red flags for me. Um, the rainbows are the ones who say, let's try it. Let's experiment. This is something new that's innovative. Fuck it, let, let's, let's go. And if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. And we know for next time. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, the, the yes anders definitely stuck, stuck with me. Um, and the conversation around being the representation for everyone uh, behind you um, is, I feel that so strong like so strongly. And I, I, I think it's really important that as we talk about coalition building, like we talk about these red flags so that folks who are creating these relationships with other uh, theatrical organizations or other advocacy organizations can really be clear um, and have somewhat of a roadmap by not only watching this conversation, but letting this conversation be a starting point um, as they move forward. Any other rainbows or, or red flags that, that you'd love to, you know, archive at this point? I'll say one more thing in regards to that. Um, one of the biggest things that I love is intersectionality because leaning into, uh, with ITM, the reason I love coalition building is because you will interact with an array of people. And that's how we learn. That's how we learn from one another. That's how we learn compassion, empathy, um, a better understanding. And this is how you create some like dope art um, when you have all of these different perspectives. And so the red flags to me don't also just come from PWIs. Sometimes, or a lot of times it comes from theater coalitions or not coalitions, theater groups that are one identity because then it goes into its own thing. So I'll speak in regards to like the Latina community where then folks tend to try to um, control what Latinidad is. What does it mean to be Latine? And then people then fight over the terminology of Latinx and Latine and the beautiful um, colonized language of Spanish and how it needs to be upkept and upheld. Um, in the native like theater scene, it's very much like, are you native enough to say this? Are you native enough to do this? Are you native enough for blah, blah, blah and upholding blood quantum um, while they're doing their like indigenous activism, quote unquote. And so that's another red flag is how are these folks showing up? Because all, kin, all skin folks are not kin folks. So it's how are these folks showing up and what work are they doing to elevate people from their communities or intersectional communities? And if it is gatekeeping or trying to impose their views onto you because they feel that they are the key holder of Latinidad or nativeness, those are, that's a huge red flag for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Same with queerness. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I definitely want to piggyback off of that. Real. Um, and yes, and all of your like, classification of what falls under the rainbow and add for myself too to that. Um, the like, yes, folks seeking inclusivity and doing the actual work on the ground, but also to like Lindsay's previous point too, like people are all starting out from their different places of understanding. And I think that it gets so easy to look at this in terms of like black and white and like, this is a good person and that is a bad person. When like it, everything in our life queerness, whatever, is it like a spectrum. And so like there has to be space for people to, there has to be room for people to be able to grow and change and learn, which I feel like 
is, I don't know, one of the most beautiful things I find about the human condition is that we can always expand and we can always grow and we can always learn if you feel so compelled to do so. And so um, to that, I also just want to add like this notion that like, oh, PWIs as, as a whole, like are inherently negative, like, versus like, oh yeah, if there are organizations of people of color that those potentially have no harm that they're enacting either. When both organizations, both groups potentially have come up underneath the same system that we all have to individually take responsibility for. Like, and that's the rainbow for me is where I can see specific individuals inside of an organization taking responsibility for where they are owning where they are, where they may be lacking, where they need to move forward and grow. So I really respect, Lindsay, like some of the things that you were naming as part of like your own, like, you know, things that you would like to grow in for yourself because you can't speak for an organization. An organization is the sum of its parts. It's made up of the people who are pushing forward the mission. Um, and so I say like, we all have, have the potential to have internalized something, whether it's been passed down or learned or whatever, um, we all have the potential to have internalized something that does not serve us and or does not serve our community at large and the people that we want to uplift and grow forward toward and ultimately like the scaffolding of the world that we want to see and want to live in as collaborators. And so I guess that's maybe my two-parter of like, that's the rainbow for me. And the red flags are when people are like staunchly stuck in their ways and don't think that they're the problem and want to point fingers and, you know, talk about exactly as Radal was saying, but like the work that we have to do when like the work feels like such a vague term and it also feels like finite as if it's not an ongoing lifelong journey to continue to unpack and unseed and then plant new seed and um, I don't know, move forward towards a better version of, and healthier version of yourself. And all of that, ultimately, when we as artists and the art comes from us, from our soul, like all of that feeds into the betterment of the collaborative. Um, yeah. Yeah, yes, anding all of what Jazz said and all of what Rial said. Um, I think for me, uh, a green flag is is always allowing um, its members to be human and allowing them grace. Um, Jazz, something that you said that stuck with me that you kind of started when Lindsay uh, shared shared her piece. But yeah, we are all like the work. <laughs> we love the air quotes. Is is ongoing and and organizations that um, that work to, to, to know how to like apologize to their artists and take responsibility for their own um, fallibility is, is always a big rainbow flag. Um, I've encountered that a lot in my own work as a leader, like you mess up and other people mess up and, and just like allowing grace between artists is like a really rainbow flag for me. Um, unrelated, a big a red flag for me with organizations is when um, they're more concerned with uh, their uh, their bag than their art. Um, <laughs> I, there's been I've been at a lot of uh, places where the concerns and desires of the I will just name it. We're on Hell Round. I'm going to do it. The mm -hmm. older white folks who patronize the theater are more important than the things that the artists want to say and more important than move, using the art to actually say something. And that's always a big red flag for me when they're gonna prioritize the money over the art. And I understand it's money is hard and tight. And we're all struggling artists and I super get that, but there are so many ways in which to, to, to make the art a priority while still um, prioritizing your, your mission statement. And when companies do that by the wayside, that's a red flag. Right. Do you think it's a time to have a deeper discussion with those companies? When do you know when to continue the conversation and when to end the conversation and, and take your, your company, your org in a different direction? Yeah, them? absolutely. Um, I've definitely been in experiences with companies where they are like, well, we can't do this play because if we do this play, the old white folks won't want to come see it or they will complain. And that is a moment where I think for me, it's always, well, then I have to take my art elsewhere because you are in a position where you either have, to, if you have a, a, a subscriber base or a patron base that is going to 
react uh, poorly to works by QT BIPOC artists, maybe it's worth alienating that base and you have to find another base if you don't want racist, homophobic, transphobic patrons. Um, and placating those patrons is playing into white supremacy, to transphobia, to all of those things. Um, so when it becomes a choice between the art and not alienating a, a subscriber base that is racist, transphobic, all of these things, that's that's the moment for me. Beautiful. Hey, I'm so, just just I'm so sorry. Just because um, you sparked something, what is that organization doing to uphold that? If that is their audience base, could you? Re I'm not quite sure I understand the the question. Well, no, 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 it's not a question. It's oh. rhetorical. <laughs> <In regard. laughs> so what is, you know, just for, for those who, you know, may need more context, are, are you also kind of pointing out the fact or asking the rhetorical question of what is the organi organization doing to uphold white supremacy? What is the organization doing to uphold oppression? Are they, yeah, is, so are, is that a part of the context? Okay. Yeah, Absolutely, so you know yes. how, how Leo was saying that if their audience base or their donors or their patrons, et cetera, um, are offended by this kind of intersectional new works or any kind of diversity, et cetera, um, what has the organization itself been doing to craft and create that culture and to have made it stand that long? Absolutely. It makes me think about another question. And CJ, if you want to add anything, you are more than welcome. Um, would you like to go I ahead? Everyone has, uh, I'm just in agreement with everyone. And um, I think just to build off of that, just uh, finding the rainbows in the organizations that are willing to break down the barriers and the structures. Um, I think with arts organizations and theaters, we just get so caught up in like the structures and the bureaucracy and um, finding um, theater partners like in the margin who are so willing to break down those structures and just really focus on the art and the advocacy that to us uh, with Breaking Wave, that's just the, the people we seek out. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Okay. All of those conversations <laughs> really spark something for me, especially because we, for me in my head, I think a lot about like capitalism and how we have to literally survive. So when we talk about this coalition building, you know, um, uh, growing our communities, uh, especially as, as uh, you know, QT BIPOC folks is just a part of our different cultures. It just is what it is. And my question when it comes to coalition building um, is, is there ever a time that you've seen or experienced a red flag that you have still worked with an organization because they were able to fund your project or there would be the capacity for an organization to fund your project? And I apologize if this is asking for a little bit too much transparency. Um, but I, I really want to have this conversation. I really want to be able to understand Yes, there are, has there ever been a time that you've seen a red flag and you've still moved forward because you wanted your company to grow and the, the company that you were working with could possibly bring, uh, bring your, uh, your organization into a wider lens for a wider audience? You know, usually it's a no for me because it's the reason that in the margin started is to avoid that. The reason that in the margin exists is because we're tired of it. We're exhausted of it. And so if that is something the institution that we are partnering with cannot, if we cannot collaborate in that sense, then it's like, okay, then we just don't align. Um, and usually, now, sometimes, um, because we do lead with grace and also I, as it's been mentioned prior, when there's reparations or there's an attempt and willingness to, as also Lindsay and Leo and um, whatnot were saying, is to like um, mend bridges or 
to have that kind of opportunity to discuss things, be transparent, um, and work together to try to mend, um, then of course there might be like opportunities to mend said relationships. But sometimes it's one of those things of like, I don't wanna keep doing the work for you. I don't wanna keep educating you. I don't wanna keep like having you learn by your mistakes that cause harm towards us. Um, but there are some times where it has to be strategic and that sucks. Like it really sucks where sometimes we have to swallow our pride and go like, well, this is gonna look really great if it's slapped onto to, if their logo slapped onto to one of our things and yada, yada, even though they treat us like shit or blah, 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 blah. Um, and then when you get to the certain point when you're like, oh, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very strategic thing, but usually it's a no for me. Got it, got it. What about you, CJ? I'm kind of interested in, in your thoughts around this, especially um, experiencing your work. Um, prior to this? Yeah, I think uh, it's just, we haven't had the opportunity yet. Um, actually, I think this coming next year is going to be the first time we'll be working with organizations outside of like grant organizations to actually produce work. So we'll see, you know, I'll have a more concrete answer for that next year. But definitely, um, I can definitely see the challenge um, with a place like Guam, we really, um, we, we have, there's limited resources in terms of the money that's funneling into the arts back home, um, just because of our status of like being a U.S. territory, we get into some weird things with grants where they're like, well, you're not quite the U.S., <laughs> you're not 50 states, states comma, Puerto Rico. Um, and so we, we definitely have um, a lot less um, opportunities for grants than um, we'd like. And so I, I could imagine that if we ran into a situation <laughs> where an organization were to try to fund us that, you know, it, it may be a little bit difficult, but I definitely would um, agree with Rayal and leaning towards no, uh, because with Breaking Wave, we also, you know, were founded as a way to um, have this space for community theater, a way to not have to be, you know, controlled by um, government organizations or schools and not having to, um, um, yeah, fit into a box. <laughs> and so I definitely think if the opportunity were to arise where we were um, to be funded by an organization that had some red flags, I'd, I'd really hope um, we'd say no. And I will save this down to uh, remember. <laughs> but yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Jazz or uh, Lindsay, Leo. Any time that you've ever had to step away um, from an opportunity, what seemed like a great opportunity to others, but didn't necessarily connect or a time that you went forward, even though you knew that it didn't uh, connect with the core uh, mission and, and purpose and vision of your org? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I struggle with that this at the donor level. Um, and I, we basically, I basically had to, we, with our producing artistic director, um, ask one of our largest, you know, talking to the tune of half a million, almost a million dollars to step away because I'm just going to quote him. He said he would not give us any more money if we continued to use the blacks on stage. Um, and we said, and he used that as a threat. Um, and we called his bluff and, um, we no longer see him. And, um, and to me, that's just a very clear example of saying, great, you, you can head out of the door now, but then there's kind of what we were discussing before. There's these other sort of more gray area examples where you feel like taking money from frankly, wealthier, older white people is giving them the idea that you're just going to perpetuate what they want to see on stage. And it kind of makes it feel like they have something over you. Um, you know, like they're, you're in some way have to answer to them, which is not true, but I think it's that sort of, you know, standing up and saying, just because you gave us money does not mean that we have to show only what you relate to on our stage. Um, and I think that's 
a conversation that I hope is becoming bigger in the American theater because previously folks have said, well, our donors, our subscribers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, but that really can't be an, an excuse or a reason. Um, so I think that that is, that's just a very, it's a hard and delicate relationship. Um, and also knowing when to say thanks, but no thanks. Um, you know, your services are no longer required. Uh, your support is no longer required for the direction that we're going as an organization. Absolutely, Absolutely I, that. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I just wanna take a moment just because we are live and we are, you know, streaming to people all over the country and internationally, just to take a bit of a breath for anyone who may have been triggered by, you know, some of the conversation or have experienced the, those kind of like workplace violences, no matter what your social location is. So I just wanted us to take like a quick little breath because a lot of us know how to push through. Um, but this is supposed to be a safe space. So I just want to acknowledge that on this uh, live stream right now and just take a, a little second. Joy. Amazing. Go ahead, Jess. Thank you, Whitney. Um, yeah, yes, anding to everything that has already been said. Um, I, there's something so amazing now in this day and age, especially with the advent of like technology moving as fast as it has. And with like the, the ability for us to connect, like the fact that I know the brilliance that is CJ Ochoco, even though like she was based in Guam previously and I was here in the States, you know, like there's something about the world becoming smaller that allows collaboratives like in the margin, like the work that we're doing here to exist with or without funding, right? Like artists are going to create art because that is the thing that they are called to do. And there are people who will do that for free. Not that they should, it is work and they should be paid and compensated for their time and their brilliance and the things that it brings to you. But like, that doesn't stop the artist from creating. Um, and so I know too then that to, to your question, Whitney, I feel like I'm able to balance um, knowing that I have spaces like in the margin, that I have spaces like Womb, which is truly just an incubator. It really is just like highlighting artists who are already doing the thing that they want to do and saying like, hey, I want to tell my friends about you too. Since you're already going to do that show, let's do it over here, right? Like um, balancing having spaces like that with the strategic, to Real's point and to Lindsay's point, like the strategic choices to potentially put myself as a barrier um, or a, pro a protective barrier, I suppose, between my artists, the people that I want to support and uplift and an institution. Um, and to circle back to our previous conversation too, in understanding that there are gray areas, that it is a spectrum and that we hope that people have the opportunity and the impetus to change. Who am I to say to an organization that like obviously is showing me a red flag that um, this is the only way they'll ever be and it's the way that they'll always be, right? Like I, like, I feel like there still has to be someone who says, no, I will not stand for that or that is not okay. And so I find a, a special strange type of joy in um, being able to use my voice in that way to say like, oh, that's actually a red flag. And I'm gonna call you on that, just so you know. Like, yeah, we're collaborating together. Thank you for this funding. Like, maybe I won't choose to work with them again in the future on a project. Ultimately, it's their response that tells me if it's something that's worth pursuing, if it's something that can grow toward better. Um, but that's the thing, like just like, uh, we've, everyone, in the world has experienced a grievance toward themselves personally or artistically, whatever. Um, but it is always in the naming of that grievance and then being able to gauge how someone responds to it if it's worth continuing a conversation. Um, so I, I don't know, I've, I find myself hopeful that I can leave an imprint on organizations. Not that that's my responsibility, it is not but I'm going to speak my truth in whatever space I'm in. And if it helps push an organization, a PWI or what have you toward 
a better version of itself, then great. Um, and yeah, yeah, there's more ruminating in there, but I think I'll leave it there. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Leo, did you have something that you wanted to add? I mean, something just very, very briefly. I uh, The Juvenilia Collective has only partnered with ITM up until this point. Um, so we're very blessed in that regard um, to, to have to have a lot of rainbows. Um, but I know that personally, as an artist, I have definitely um, been in jobs or in um, positions where I've seen a lot of red flags and because of how it would look on a resume, because I'm still very much like an emerging artist or whatever that means, um, I have pushed through and I have a lot of regrets about that. And um, I, the moments where I did stand up uh, for myself or for uh, injustices I was witnessing. Uh, they were difficult and challenging, but always ultimately rewarding. And um, I, I really want to thank all of you on this panel for sharing because I think it's, it's emboldening to hear um, and inspiring to hear. Um, and yeah, I, I guess more ruminating, but yeah, I have definitely pushed through some red flags when I maybe should have pumped the brakes and said, hold on, this is not okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that in that moment of vulnerability. I really appreciate that. Um, I think a few people on this call or on this uh, live stream also do as well. As we get ready uh, to- May kind I just of add one more thing? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've, I've said this already, um, but just to restate, um, is this is always not with PWIs. Like it can happen with BIPOC or queer theaters as well. Um, sometimes our missions or our visions don't align and sometimes that's okay. Um, and other times it's like, it's okay. We're in different spaces, I guess. Um, and so be it, but that just means that we won't collaborate. Um, mm -hmm. And I hope that the work that you are doing is serving your communities or whoever it is that you're serving. Um, but I just wanted to state that as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate you for, <laughs> for stating that, right? Like we're all, we are all working. We are all works in progress, no matter what our social location is, no matter what our, our cultural background is, like we are all, uh, all have something to work on. And, you know, one thing I talk a lot about is making sure that we don't um, create these uh, these trauma bonds, right, um, around our oppression, no matter what our social location is, right? And so the way that I want to end this call is with a lot, you know, with with what we would call one of my um, former organizations, a love fest. Um, and I'm really interested in ending this call with a love fest, not only uh, for um, uh, Real on an Alanis, but I'm really interested in ending this call with a love fest for ITM. And I would love for you all to not only talk about ITM or give one reason uh, why you enjoy ITM, but why you chose to build along with Real um, as one of the leaders of ITM. And that's how we're going to close out today. I want, before we end, I, I really want to make sure that we uh, thank our ASL interpreters, Valerie Avia um, and Benny Yamas. Um, also, of course, I really want to thank um, those behind the camera, behind the scenes that work with HowlRound, um, those who have been working in press, media, to ensure that the New American Theater Fest um, is as spectacular as it will, as it has been this year and the years to come. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and as we end, let's finish with our love fest about one reason why uh, you have chosen to build with ITM. And Real, you can't go. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you like to jazz, go, uh, let's go B Street. One reason. They always want to do more and be stronger and more innovative than the day before. That they are always 
you know, pushing themselves in the most positive ways. Uh, there is, uh, there's, there's no, we're, we're in the place we want to be. They always want to do better, be more inclusive, build stronger collaborations, connections, uh, and, and do the best work possible. And they're always thinking, uh, uh, ahead and in the, in the past, present and future and how to accomplish that. And yes. so of course, shout out to Royale and then Pran and Amber and Edgar and the whole ensemble, Jazz, Leo, so many people um, who we've gotten the chance to know in person and virtually uh, during this process. So I love the chance to love bomb <laughs> virtual love fest. Yes. And where can people find out more about B Street? Uh, Bstreettheater.org is our website. And uh, we still got uh, some more events in the New American Theater Festival, another panel and streaming tomorrow and streaming Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and that is our, that is our uh, auspicious closing. So we are very excited after 24 days of programming, uh, which is super awesome. I know exactly. <laughs> to then a vacation. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. We appreciate you having you here. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you so Let's, much. And thanks. To absolutely. Everyone. Absolutely. Let's jump on over to Leo. Tell us why uh, one, one reason why you are happy to work with uh, ITM? Uh, I am so over the moon to work with ITM because uh, they lead with yes. Uh, they like they love to tell you, yes, you can do that. Or no, we can't do that. And let's figure out a way to do something else different, better. Um, and they do it all without um, hierarchical BS. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear at the hell round. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, that that spirit of generosity and and leading with just complete yes and faith in their artists is why I'm so, so, so very happy to be a part of ITM and so much thanks to, to the team over there, everyone. Awesome. Where can people find out more about Juvenalia? The Juvenalia Collective. You can find us at thejuvenaliacollective.com or on Instagram at the Juvenalia Collective. This upcoming month, we've got uh, a drunk reading of New Moon, and uh, there's more info about that coming soon. And we've also got some podcasts and all of that you can find on our website. Amazing. Thank you so much, Leo. We appreciate having you here. Uh, Jazz, we're going to jump on over to you. One reason why you love working with ITM and why you chose to build with them. Oh my goodness. In the margin. Uh, it's just such a wonderful collective. I chose to work with them because I have never felt so aligned in mission and also just so held in space um, by a beautiful group of people that is literally ever expanding. They always have more room in the group hug. It's always like space for one more. And um, it truly is people who are collaborating together because they love to do it. And so yes, leading with yes is absolutely the culture and um, I'm just so grateful to know and collaborate with these folks. They're all so wonderful. Absolutely. I feel the same way and I appreciate you for verbalizing it. <laughs> Tell us uh, where we can find out more information about uh, the Womb Collective. Yes, Womb the Creation Space. You can follow us on Instagram at womb.thecreationspace and we'll have more coming to you soon. Beautiful. Thank you. CJ, we're gonna we're, we're coming over to the end. Um, one reason why you're building with ITM. Uh, well, ITM is the first um, organization that we have um, started collaborating with outside of Guam. And I think um, one of the reasons is the fact that they are willing to work with us, you know, being so far away, it gets a little isolating and, you know, Real um, and the rest of the group were, have been so willing to work with our time zones and reaching out and checking in on us through the pandemic and being like, let's still do this. And so we're just so grateful um, for just their willingness to welcome us in <laughs> to the American theater space, really. I think um, for the longest time, we've always felt so far removed. And um, to be like, no, we're, we're part of this. <laughs> and uh, we're so grateful for, um, for Rael and everyone for welcoming, welcoming us in. Thank you. Thank you. And where can people find out about uh, the breaking, wave, breaking the wave? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, we're on social media at BWTC Guam, and then our website is bwtcguam.com. Um, and we definitely plan um, through um, the future to still continue to do some virtual work. So even if you can't fly to Guam, you can definitely, you know, still catch some of our projects online. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Riel, as we close officially, I have one question for you. I have one sentence that I know this might be very difficult for you, but the question is um, with ITM, what does it mean to build? Through ITM, what does it mean to build? As we elevate what theater is and as we elevate what advocacy is, one sentence. Let's see if you can do this. <laughs> yes. Thank you. This is what it means to build. We appreciate you, Rial. We love you. We love on you. We will do everything um, to ensure that your work is seen, that members of the uh, ITM collective are seen, um, and that we will continue to, to build, that we will continue to build coalitions. Again, thank you everyone that is here. My name is Whitney Reed, and I am so grateful to be able to have uh, facilitated this conversation tonight. Thank you again, HowlRound, um, for your sponsorship and the opportunity to be seen um, within the US and abroad. Thank you all so much, and we hope Hold that you on. have a I have one night. last thing, I Whitney. Want to make sure that Riel also has the opportunity to say anything that they want um, about uh, the closing as we get ready to close the national, the New American Theater Fest. Before that, I want to ask Whitney, where can we find more on the Urban Window, and why did Ooh. you choose to partner with us? Oh, that I love you. Um, wow. So the Urban Window, you can come to Instagram or you can actually just email me. That's usually how people honestly <laughs> find me straight up. Um, it's uh, Whitney at theurbanwindow.com. Um, reach out to me, ask me a question. If you're concerned about like, am I saying this correctly? How do I get a little bit of press about this work that I'm doing? Or um, what are ways that I can actually cultivate new audiences for the, the authentic work that I'm doing? Email me, Whitney at theurbanwindow.com. Why do I uh, build with ITM? Because ITM is me. ITM is me. ITM is an opportunity for uh, someone who is at many different intersections. And when I am with um, some of my fellow ITM members, I feel like I'm home. I feel like I'm normal. And I, it is the best feeling um, that I have when it comes uh, to being an artist and a creative, feeling like you're with your, with your folks. So that's why I build with ITM. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else that you want to say about the New American Theater Fest before we close? Uh, yes. Well, minute. first off, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone. I'm trying really hard not to have the waterworks happen right now. Um, I, y'all are folks that I see as very powerful people, very powerful leaders that are incredibly just beyond talented. And I hope you recognize that of yourselves. Um, and I am just forever grateful that y'all saw our mission and vision and said, yes, we'll work with you. Um, and I think, it, not I think, it, it, that's just, it's just beautiful. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have deep admiration for everyone here on this call. Um, the last thing I will say about the New American Theater Festival, um, as Lindsay had mentioned, we have programming throughout this um, last week. There are some things that are going to be in person in Sacramento. So if anyone finds themselves around Sacramento, where they're at the Sophia, where um, B Street is, so please come join us. Make sure you have your proof of vaccination and your ID. Um, other than that, you can still stream our things. Um, everything is still online on B Street Theater's Facebook page. So if you want to stream anything that we have, any of the 10 new works, any of our panels, um, head on over there. Uh, also, our panels are on HowlRound. Uh, it's a series on HowlRound, so make sure to head over there to watch the rest of the panels. Um, follow us on Instagram, 
in the margin underscore itm follow us on tiktok at in the margin and thank you all so much thank you have a beautiful night everyone thank you so much for joining us <laughs>